It was just hard to focus. And it's also hard for me to sometimes hear people or connect to class. This is Antonio. Well, I mean, if I have to wear a mask, I will, but I just don't like wearing one, which is why I'd like to get vaccinated so I don't really have to wear one. (laughs) He goes to school near Berkeley, California. He'll be 12 in October, and next month, he'll be a sixth grader. Well, when my school shut down, like, towards the middle of March, and, like, the first day it shut down, everyone was, like, super excited because they thought it was, like, going to be, like, some sort of long break or something. So we were like, oh, yay, like, school's out for a little while. Lucy is 12 years old. It's kind of different than what we expected. She goes to school in New York City. She'll be entering eighth grade in the fall. And Becky. After too long of, like, seeing people, like, only on a screen, it's kind of, like... I don't know, it's just not the same as seeing people in person and, like, socializing like we usually would, like, going to people's houses and stuff. She's 15. She'll be a 10th grader in September. They, along with more than 75 million K-12 through students, are heading back to school soon. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have released guidelines for their welcome back into the classroom. The CDC says fully vaccinated teachers, students, and staff do not need to wear masks inside schools. Some states have decided to come up with their own guidelines, but those plans could potentially fall by the wayside if the Delta variant works its way into schools. So are teachers, parents, and students getting the help and resources they need to make up for the two school years that were devastated by the pandemic? What was laid bare about inequalities in education? And when it comes to our kids, what's the new normal? I'm WCBS News Radio's Linda Lopez, and this is Connect the Dots from Odyssey. We're just weeks away from K-12 schools opening their doors back up for students full-time after hybrid learning in the spring. It was nice. It was much better. I was able to connect a lot more to other things. My grades were getting better in person, kind of. I feel like it's going to like be weird completely going back to normal, like not wearing your mask all the time or like not, not being like really far from people. Being able to be there like the whole day. I'm excited for that rather than like going back and forth or just like seeing it through like a screen. But the Delta variant is driving up COVID-19 case rates across the globe as people everywhere seemed to travel in droves, fleeing the inside of their homes. Daily coronavirus cases have doubled in the last three weeks nationwide. And now health officials are worried about how the Delta variant is affecting children and young adults. Over the last 12 days, health officials say San Francisco is seeing a threefold increase in cases because of a combination I was hoping, you know, we could resume back to pre-pandemic life this summer. Dr. Peter J. Hotez is the dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College in Houston. And he's the co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. And, you know, based on what I knew a few months ago, I thought we'd get there between fully vaccinating and and not having the Delta variant. But as John Lennon says, uh, life is what happens in between making plans. So... So now we've got the Delta variant, which is more transmissible, and now we've got these areas of lacking vaccination. So that that introduces a lot of risk and uncertainty. Especially with the string of COVID-19 outbreaks tied to summer camps in recent weeks in states like Kansas, Missouri, Florida, Illinois, and Texas. And now, heading into the fall, infectious disease experts and some teachers are questioning whether these few restrictions from the CDC will be enough to mitigate spread across school campuses, especially since children under 12 still aren't eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. Mark Airgood is a special education teacher in Oakland and a member of the activist group By Any Means Necessary. We should not be bringing together totally unvaccinated elementary school and sixth graders face to face. His concerns, an indication of how amorphous the federal mask guidelines are, leaving school districts and counties in disarray, which is apparent in the wildly different reactions from various states around imposing those rules. California received some pushback last week after announcing it would still require even vaccinated students, faculty and staff to don masks. First, 
State officials issued a rule Monday barring unmasked children from school campuses in the fall. So it went to work on revising. But then a turnaround. Just a few hours later, they rescinded that decision, saying individual districts should decide for themselves. In Georgia, the DeKalb County School District, which includes Atlanta, saw strong masking compliance among students last year and announced it would still require that masks be worn by students and staff in the fall. Meanwhile, in Arizona, a recently approved budget bans public schools and universities from enforcing mask mandates, as well as enforcing COVID-19 testing for unvaccinated students. And a group of New Jersey parents are suing to prevent the state's governor from enforcing another school mask mandate this year. These guideline and vaccination disparities have created what Dr. Hotez describes as two Americas. Yeah, I mean, I think it very much depends on what part of the country you're in. So I think most parts of California, I think the Northeast, where transmission will be way down because so many people are vaccinated, I think. Uh, we can do in-person classrooms pretty uh, in a pretty straightforward manner. I think, you know, in, for instance, um, most of the adolescents and adults will be vaccinated. I think you can operate middle schools, high schools uh, very safely. And even the for the younger kids that are not old enough to be vaccinated, if community transmission is down, as we would expect in the Northeast in California, um, in-person classes for the elementary school should go well in that regard. I think the more problematic one is going to be uh, in parts of the country where Delta is accelerating and vaccination rates are low. Uh, you know, and for instance, in, in Louisiana and Mississippi, where you've got fewer than 20 percent of the adolescents vaccinated, most of the young adults are not vaccinated. Uh, you're going to still have a lot of transmission in the in the as 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 everyone goes starts going back to school next month because a lot of the schools in the south start in August. That could be problematic, and and then we're all kind of holding our breath, seeing how that goes. But the silver lining, according to a survey from the National Education Association, the teachers' union with three million members nationwide, about. 86% of its members had received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine as of late May. That's up from 49% a month earlier. But while a plan may be in place, schools still face some obstacles ahead. Fears of getting infected by COVID-19, the stresses of having to teach for long hours from home with limited resources, and the frustrations with school boards have already driven some teachers away from their schools, some from the industry altogether some just choosing to retire. The California State Teachers Retirement System is predicting that 2021 will see near record numbers of retiring educators. North Texas school districts are in a hiring frenzy to get staffed up by next month. Florida is facing a science teacher shortage. And some districts in the San Francisco Bay Area are even offering cash incentives to prevent faculty from leaving. So... Are teachers and schools going to get the help they need after more than a year of these unprecedented challenges? Well, last week, $635 million was promised by New York City to help its students catch up in the wake of a tumultuous 16 months of disjointed learning. The sweeping plan includes 9 million new books for classroom libraries and screening for every young child for reading challenges. The DOE plans to order 175,000 new tablets and laptops, expand college counseling services, add new AP options and develop a new universal curriculum that Mayor de Blasio called the Mosaic. Teachers Union President Michael Mulgrew is on board, saying the new curriculum will help address a long-standing problem for city educators scrambling to find relevant materials for a diverse student body. And in California, a bill's been introduced to help public school students recover from COVID setbacks. Newsom signed legislation to send nearly $124 billion to California schools. Also in the Golden State, California is now set to become the first state in the nation to permanently offer free school meals for all children attending K-12 through public schools. The new school nutrition program will offer breakfast and lunch for all students every school day. Berkeley Senator Nancy Skinner introduced the bill. Any child who wants a meal will get a meal. Absolutely. That's the whole point of the program. A hungry kid doesn't learn well. We want all our kids well-fed. But 
the stark inequalities in education and elsewhere were only amplified and made more apparent by the pandemic. There were deep divides in terms of children being able to access school. Dr. Janelle Scott is professor of policy, measurement, and evaluation at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Education. Some of those accessibility issues had to do with having reliable uh, devices, having high-speed internet access, issues of housing insecurity, food insecurity, but also the fact that COVID had such disproportionate effects in terms of race and social class. And so Black and Latinx and Indigenous populations were experiencing uh, rates of COVID infection and and, and death at much higher uh, proportions than more advantaged populations. And so naturally, children within those families are also experiencing those deep losses and health challenges despite, you know, schools and districts' best efforts uh, to make things accessible and equitable. So what did distance learning look like for underserved or for majority Black and brown communities versus others? Well, I think that, you know, we have a situation in which with remote schooling, children are really expected to be able to log on, to stay uh, focused, but also in terms of the supports they would need from adults, right? If they don't understand something, if um, if the technology glitches, which it does all the time, um, right? We all had to do this at the last minute. And so children who had parents whose jobs or finances enabled them to be home and, and attentive to them had a you know built-in advantage in, in that domain. And so what we really saw was that home resources in terms of economic resources and adults who could be attentive in the home, that there were deep inequalities in, in that space. And so children who had parents who uh, were essential workers, who were healthcare workers, who had um, who work in the gig economy in terms of, you know, things like Lyft and Uber and, and such, you know, couldn't rely on parents necessarily to be home. We also know that many children who live in poverty live in multifamily situations, right? And so having just a quiet space to do remote schooling can be a challenge when you're sharing space in a multifamily situation where there are multiple children, um, you know, vying for the Wi-Fi and even, you know, outlet access, uh, let alone having adults who can help. So these are some of the things that show up in a remote situation. So considering all those challenges that you were just Mm -hmm. mentioning, how did this impact special needs students and how they could learn Mm -hmm. from home? Well, special needs students, I think, are, you know, I think one of the biggest concerns in terms of inequality. Um, We know that there are a range of disabilities that manifest. Some are physical, some are social and emotional, some are sensory processing. And so that that shows up, I think, in very acute ways uh, when the one modality for instruction is a remote offering. Uh, Many districts did prioritize getting those students back in person as soon as they were able to do so safely, right? And so that's what you saw in many districts, school districts around the country. Neurotypical students or students without physical disabilities were were being brought back. That you were using the school buildings to to provide uh, safe instruction to students with disabilities in person. So that was something many districts did prioritize. But it did come, you know, several months into 2020. Now what? What do we need to understand in order to move past these challenges? We really are going to need to understand that educational issues can't be understood separate from issues of housing security, from issues of health supports, and from issues of food security. And so I think my hope is that we uh, come to see education as part of a broader ecology in which children and young adults grow up in and how we can support and sustain young people throughout the, their educational trajectory. So things like after school programs um, and other sorts of support, I think, are just so clearly needed. And COVID has really helped to reveal those needs in a really important way. What will it take to return to normal? I think we need to take stock of what actually has been lost. Um, You know, students have learned an awful lot this year about about our government's response to the pandemic, about um, how to navigate times of crisis and um, social unrest. And so I think, you know, coming back into the fall, much of what teachers will do is what they do very well, which is take stock of what students know and are able to do, and will try and meet those needs um, with high quality instruction. And so I think, you know, supports can um, can go a long way in helping to reduce class sizes, so that students, can, uh, teachers can give 
students the attention uh, they need. So I think investing in um, also mental health and other health supports in schools because uh, we need um, significant investments in testing and tracing for, you know, the continued Delta variant of COVID, but also the kind of some social and emotional needs that students will um, no doubt present with as they uh, they reacclimate themselves to learning in person. Um, many students have lost family members. Um, and again, those, those uh, losses have been felt most acutely in, in Black and Latinx and Indigenous communities. And so we'd want to invest significant supports um, in helping students to make sense of and cope uh, with those losses. Um, and those losses you know, are ongoing. And so that will be a long-term support that's needed. Dr. Janelle Scott, Professor of Policy, Measurement, and Evaluation at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Education. On Thursday, the first monthly federal child tax credit payments began hitting the bank accounts of parents with children under the age of 18. I believe this is actually a historic day. Historic day in the sense that we continue to build an economy that respects and recognizes the dignity of working class families and middle class families. It's historic and it's our effort to make another giant step toward ending child poverty in America. According to the White House, it has sent out a total of $15 billion in payments to families of nearly 60 million children, up to $300 per month for every child under six, and $250 per month for every child ages six to 17. We know that if children do not have access to healthy food, like infants, small children, toddlers, it will have a negative impact on their brain development. Lori D. Jones is CEO of Phil Abundance, a food distribution nonprofit in Philadelphia. We know that if children don't have access to a healthy meal, that they're not able to, they're not going to be able to learn in school. So we know there are um, long-term educational impacts of this. We know there are long-term um, health and, and developmental impacts on this. It's critically important. We have always been working to partner with other organizations like ours, talking to elected officials, government officials about providing supplements and support for people who face um, food insecurity. That's always been a part of what we've done. We've always said, let's increase SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, what we used to call food stamps, to ensure that people had money in their hands to make healthy decisions and purchase food for their families. And oh, by the way, when they have that, they're supporting the local economy. So that's actually been something we've always supported. The other thing I'll, I'll share is that we talked about what happened over the last year in COVID. We had another very special thing happen at Bill Abundance for the people that we serve. Back in January on King Day of Service, then President-elect Biden visited us. He came and helped us pack boxes of food that would go out to our agencies and people who are food insecure. While at Phil Abundance, we talked, we said, we're talking now about emergency food assistance, but we also want to work to end hunger for good. We also want to work to address these root causes. It doesn't make any sense that people are only getting the food in boxes from us. How else can we make sure that families and children are fed? And he made a commitment to us then, and I think we've seen it now in this tax credit and other things. He made a commitment that he is absolutely going to work and his administration was going to work to end childhood poverty. Through the pandemic, the cries for help and apparent struggle to keep some kids fed, educated, and housed were amplified. And just maybe recognizing areas of need and offering help could be the new normal. For little ones in California, Governor Gavin Newsom, as well as several lawmakers, have championed a $2.7 billion universal transitional kindergarten program that will be phased in over the next five years. It's the result of the pandemic shining a spotlight on the importance of early childhood education and care. And in order to keep current employees and attract new ones, McDonald's is expected to offer backup child care, as well as other new benefits. The fast food company also plans to boost hourly pay, give workers paid time off, and help cover tuition costs. What does a new normal look like in the eyes of our kids? Um, I feel like normal is like now that we've been doing it for so long like it seems normal to go out and like put on a mask when you're outside but then like going back to the normal like before would be like just going out being near your friends you don't have to wear a mask you don't have to like stay socially distanced anymore you don't have to like stay at home all the time well i think I'd, i'd like to just think that just like everything else everything has an end at some point 
So staying at home is soon going to be an end. COVID's going to soon leave, and then everything will be back to normal. And what can families do to help kids get there? We want there to be channels and opportunities for kids to talk about, you know, what they're really experiencing and what they're feeling so that they can acknowledge it and ultimately cope with it. Heather Bernstein is a clinical psychologist at the Child Mind Institute of the San Francisco Bay Area. It's kind of about just asking the question about how are you doing or introducing topics or a lot of times introducing a story or something that you've heard and getting a kid's opinion about that can be a really nice way to open up the window to hear their opinion. And once you have an idea of where they're at or what their opinion is, then you can really start a conversation and it can grow from there. But the main goal is to make sure that there is some type of communication that's happening. So I think it's a balance in some ways, being able to model healthy management of stress is a really wonderful way to teach kids coping skills. Um, And so being able to say, I feel kind of worried about going back to work and this is the way I'm dealing with it can actually be really healthy modeling, but certainly for parents and other adults to get outside support so that you're able to do that is also really valuable so that your kids aren't just absorbing all of the other anxiety, but that they that they get to see and talk about it in a way that feels normative and comfortable and supportive. And as we continue to get the country vaccinated and try to move forward despite uncertainties, what are Becky, Lucy, and Antonio looking forward to the most? During the pandemic, we realized that it was something like we took for granted, like, oh, like I can just hang out with my friends anytime, but like now I can't. So I do look forward to spending more time with my friends and like my classmates and everyone that I didn't get to see before. I think it's some of my habits kind of from the pandemic. I hope they transfer over as well. Like, I feel like I've like, well, it's been like a year and a half. So I certainly hope I've like grown as a person and like, you know, become more grateful for like seeing family and everything. If anything, I'd love to go traveling again. Hawaii. Uh, Try and relax and get some time off from school, work, all of that. This week's episode of Connect the Dots was produced and edited by Mallory Samara and co-produced by Eric Brooks and me. Special thanks this week to Mike DeWald, Rebecca Corral, Jennifer Hodges, Matt Boone, Vivian Bossu skinner B. Soul, Nick Palmer, Patty Rising, Betsy Gebhardt, Kenny Choi, Marla Diamond, Tom Rickert, Ken Charles, and all our guests. The entire interview with Phil Abundant CEO Lori D. Jones can be found on KYW News Radio's website under In Depth. Until next week, I'm WCBS News Radio's Linda Lopez.